can you tell us a bit about your political trajectory and uh, how important it was um, in your political trajectory uh, what the campus of Genio has given to you in forming this political uh, pers personality that you know? Well, it was very important because uh, that's the JNU was the place where I learned my basic politics. And uh, I, as I told you, I joined JNU uh, just after school. So um, I was an undergraduate. And um, in JNU, uh, one learned uh, about uh, basic ideological uh, positions. I learned my Marxism there, okay. So, uh, and I was uh, uh, associated with the Students Federation of India, with the SFI. I uh, learned how to, uh, the importance of mass, mass work and mass struggle. And I learned, um, what can I say? I don't, know, I don't know how to put it really, but we all, I became political. And since after JNU, I went to Delhi University and I was, I continued with the same political affiliation and that experience. And then I um, became a whole timer for, uh, of, uh, you know, of both the uh, Communist Party of India Marxist as well as I was a whole timer in the Janwadi Mahila Samiti which was had just come into existence in uh, Delhi at that time. So my life's trajectory was in a sense set by that uh, certain inspirational mode of politics that I became associated with in Jainu. That was the thing. It, does that answer your question? Uh -huh. um, which encounters that you've, you've done on campus were crucial in, uh, in shaping your Marxist understanding, your political understanding, uh, your political engagement? That's a very difficult question to ask because, you know, one doesn't pick out a significant incident or something like that. I can only te describe to you some broad things because, mm, the, as I have told you before, I'm no raconteur, so you know that telling the story is not my forte in that sense. But uh, when I joined JNU, there was a, they within a few months that I saw, we, there was an exhibition called, uh, it, which was put up, it was known as 25 Years of Independence. So I had, uh, I went to see the exhibition along with my mm, classmates and all. And there I was introduced, I saw SFI's name was, was there. And I had some familiarity with the name and with the organization because before coming to JNU, I had spent a year in um, what is Sir, my mother was teaching in Barhampur University and there was an SFI unit there and there was at that time uh, uh, considered a legendary student leader of that time who later of course went various directions but he was everybody he, he commanded a lot of respect and we had uh, seen him so I had some familiarity with, with uh, the name and the organization and was it was uh, post liberation of Bangladesh where we all wept and so on and so forth and we were definitely uh, 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 I mean in, there was a certain progressive kind of attachment to some social there was an urge for liberation there was an urge for liberation which is pretty common I mean it's not extraordinary I think most young people have some kind of an urge for liberation and that got attached to this. This offered a sense of liberation uh, for us. That was the thing. So I was familiar with SFI. I saw that exhibition and then I chatted with the, uh, there was one 
Neil Kanton and one N.D. Jayaprakash. I wonder if you've met him because he's also here. We used to call him the ghost who walks because he used to, in the emergency, uh, bring all the underground literature and so on. So he, he was affectionately called the ghost who walks. So, which you know is the phantom. You never read phantom comics. Eh? <laughs> okay, anyway. So, they were there. And that's how I got introduced to uh, SFI. But after that, uh, I was in languages. SFI had nothing in languages in those days. Um, but they used to, there was no organization fully formed. It still had what was known as an organizing committee. So they used to invite me to the organizing committee and that's how I met all of the others. That's how I met Prakash. And uh, I have to say that Prakash was an inspirational figure for all of us. His book, which I don't know whether you have come across, Languages and Nationality Politics, meant something to all of us because we had come, I mean to some of us at least, I came from an English uh, uh, medium school and had always felt this lack of not being able to, exp I'm sure many of you will have it, this inability to be able to find in the English language that which uh, expresses one's own physical reality or emotional reality in a certain sense, but also lacking the vernacular mastering because of our English medium. So we had different kinds of uh, things that drew us into the whole thing. And he wrote, he had this book which he used to, he spoke about, um, have you seen it? Languages and Nationality Politics in India? Of course. You've seen the book? Because it's not in print nowadays. It's in the library. <laughs> yeah, okay. So that had meaning for us. There were so, so many things, you know, I was young and I had uh, yeah, all the aspirations and I was saying for something in life which was creative, which was meaningful, which was liberatory, and this sort of uh, fitted in in that sense. So one of the things for me was language. The other thing was, of course, there was a, the uh, intellectual element, which was, let us say, a lot of discussions used to take place on what was the nature of property in India. So there was a discussion about that amongst ourselves. So, whether it was vested, in, I mean, they're arcane now for people, whether it was vested in the state or the individual, things like that. And there were a lot of discussions about a lot of subjects which were, you know, saying, combined with this militant activism which was, which had meaning for all those things. So, I mean, what else can I say? I can't think of incidents, very frankly. Oh. So you mentioned that you participated in group discussions on property. What other activities uh, did you participate in as part of SFI? What were your roles and general activities as part of this organization? I have to really remember. I can't think, remember. I, have, I mean, a lot of... We had some struggles. I mean, admission policy was one big thing. And around the admission policy, uh, we were in constant campaign mode, you know. We were campaigning. And for that time, languages was not a very large school. It was considered to be, uh, SSS was the center. And uh, Although Prakash and all were in SIS and I, it was earlier ISIS and uh, they used to stay in this Gomti hostel in um, um, Barakhamba Road. But um, so admission policy was one uh, key area around which there was a lot of campaign. And uh, I can remember several strikes and several struggles. I'm, 
Of course, the high point was the gharao of the Vice Chancellor, then G. Parthasarthi, which I think Prakash must have mentioned to you. Yeah, so that was the, the great, that gharao. And uh, now, don't ask me to remember all the details, but it was the high point. And uh, that, ca and then we had, you see, election campaigns were not uh, just, uh, uh, of course, the votes and elections, was, but it was the election campaign was also a time of ideological struggle, uh, discussion and debate. So we also learnt in that uh, process. Uh, that's I really can't. I mean, I'm I told I'm telling you, you know, I really can't recall um, incidents and things like that. But the high point was the Gherao at that time, and then the after that it was the emergency. So, uh, were your parents aware of your political activities on campus, and were they fine with it? No, of course my parents knew. My parents were quite progressive. Uh, but parents are parents. And <laughs> obviously it will also create, because you know, there are certain demands that are made on the family. Supposing you're not there and you push off, so on and so forth. So there were also some, naturally some clashes, but it was not on principle and not on uh, ideology. The clashes were part of day-to-day -day life, into which that was a thing. That was all there was. And it's just that, that parents also want, uh, they had certain needs also. Maybe we, we, some of us like me, I was not fulfilling if I was away all the time. I mean, as a family, people have responsibilities. So there were clashes, of course there were clashes. That was the thing, but it was not in principle and it was not in relation to, you know, it was just in relation to you should be doing this and you should be doing that and so on and so forth, which was, as I said, parents will be parents, that is the thing. But it was not in principle. I did, I did not have to, uh, let us say, I was not in, uh, I was fortunate in this, that I was not clashing ideologically in any major way with my parents. That was, I'm not, not in any major way. My mother was a liberal, my father was a, what you call a fence-sitter, but that was the thing. Okay. And uh, did they agree on the fact that you as a young woman could do politics? Yeah, I said, on this question, as I said, I have been very fortunate and privileged in the fact that my parents were not uh, hostile to the uh, polit politics of it or to what I was doing otherwise. They had, um, I mean, as just as normal parents would like their children to uh, do various things, they may have some, you see, it was part of domestic uh, uh, management. That's about it. It was not on principle. I didn't have that problem. There were others who would and did, but I was fortunate not to have that. And within the organization SFI, was there some uh, some difficulties for you as a young woman to express no. yourself there, to participate in mobilization, no, no. in strategies? Not at all. Uh, you mentioned that you were part of two organizations, SFI and the women's organization. That was later. That is later. So, how do you locate a feminist lens in being part of an organization that has a Marxist role? Because how do you balance your feminism with being a Marxist in a university like Jane? Well, I am not a feminist. Okay. I never was a feminist. And I still don't like, would not like to call myself a feminist, even though the term has become so. Uh, because um, this, this is an. Uh, I mean, you know, nowadays, of course, there's a lot of discussion. Every everyone who's in the women's movement is a feminist, but that's not really the case. 
it was not the case in history either and it's not necessarily the case today but it's a hegemonic term it has become a hegemonic term but you leave that aside but you're asking about you are asking a more basic question i think that w how uh, i mean as as a as a woman or as a young girl in terms of you see for us the liberation project was always equal what were we drawn to what is it that drew us to marxism what was it that drew us to this it was a project of liberation and it was not uh, 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 i mean as as individuals we went in as individuals i know gendered subjects and all these are all you know the thing but we went in as individuals and for us it was freedom it was liberating to be part of that thing. and uh, you must understand that uh, the organization was interested in us as coming in so again of course it is a slightly protected space jnu the others who were in the organization were also very i mean they were not being dragged down by uh, mm, living in a socially conservative cultural milieu so they were not necessarily in that mode so there was uh, a lot of um, equality and freedom uh, is to smoke on campus of course which is um, i do not want to we, we thought it was something great it was never anything great but it was like that you know it was also a sign we have liberated we are not we are we are girls we are women we think but then it created other problems if somebody in the bus when i was going on home they say acha can i have a matchbox with that sneering look no no so those were the problems so one also learned that one can have protected spaces and outside spaces are not so uh, <laughs> protected but inside the campus inside the organization there was a tremendous amount of freedom and that's what we felt we felt that freedom we really felt that freedom that was one of the characteristic features of that, that right in that panel discussion that i talked to you about yeah. uh, it's a uh, Aisha Kirwai uh, said a very interesting line that in that in JNU they feel free, not safe, but free, and that's the essence that women in JNU feel when they talk about it. So I get that sense. Yeah, they do feel free, uh, <coughs> but you know you're young. You want to be daring in any case, you know. No, <laughs> uh, yeah, you know that's the style with which you. associate yourself now it can be adventurous it can be silly at times also but that's it <laughs> don't exaggerate the thing it's, it has meaning for all of us in a certain you know in the, in the process of our growth that is it mm, i think you mentioned something about having a protest against a beauty pageant uh, event yeah back in the day but i was at delhi university when that happened. I was not in JNU. I had left. Uh, When did you leave for uh, Delhi University? Seventy-six. And what was the events around here? Well, this was the in the middle of the emergency, and uh, we later, of course, came to know that some names had been uh, targeted for uh, for getting we are for. Uh, expelling expulsion or getting rid of them from the university so i was one of them because in school of languages i was at that time most prominent uh, as by activist and in, in the struggle in the emergency I, i there was some role that i played so they wanted to get rid of me prakash's name was there sunit chopra was also there uh, there was a fourth anyway 
the so there were four or five of us whose names were to be struck off so i was one of them and uh, i was also a counselor in the union because in the last uh, in fact as i said you know i think i mentioned that day the ashoka was expelled ashoka was expelled because of a leaflet which i had drafted you know she was convener of the in the absence of the president she was the convener so she had signed it as convener of the council and you know like we say oh the time has come to strike against you know but it was not meant for a strike call it was just you know a rhetoric of how to of the for a fight but they took it like this and uh, she she was expelled i always used to feel like yeah, i'm responsible for this situation you know she had a very tough time in that whole period but anyway so that was the thing and so in 70s uh, they didn't let me sit for the exams and uh, so i couldn't continue so then i left i joined delhi university that was it as a student which course and which college i joined hindu college i joined in political science <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you also in hindu yeah. i see hindu also has a very strong political culture and political activities keep happening over there as well at that time no okay and uh, when i joined uh, the hostel was divided into the um two camps uh, we didn't think of it as bihari and uh, jhat but you know roughly speaking it was there was a very strong um, let's say feudal gang aggressive in the in the hostel and uh, uh after after the emerg- after the emergency was lifted when we started having some open activity uh, then they they used to beat up all the people who used to come with the sfi so there used to be i uh, 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 people who used to talk to me outside the campus outside the college but in the college they wouldn't want to be seen anywhere near me because then they would they were afraid they would get beaten up so it was not like that and after the emergency the delhi university was full of these goons that had been spawned by that whole period some from preceding period also but it was a lot of it was so it was not so easy and uh, uh, college in, in, in inside the college this was it was a just just a terror tactic some people still stood up to it and still came but it was not very large so how was this transition from jnu sfi where there's huge support for a marxist ideology and there's a safe space for your ideology and then you go to hindu in delhi university and you don't find that space in your college where you could openly express your marxist ideology and propagate it i did express uh, um, to to the extent that um, uh, i have to say that even as i said this opposition was there i would become paralyzed but it's nobody beat me up from the college and all of them used to come and talk to me so I don't know whether you know. There's a certain way in which Gundaism works in, in university campuses, and one of the ways is you also keep a dialogue open, and then you beat up on the other side. You know, that's it's a culture. It's a, it's a very. Uh, so anyway, so that was there, um, but it it of course it was different. Uh, after the emergency, the first election, I got elected to the councillorship. and then i got elected to the dusu ec so that's another story in itself that's a real story <laughs> then uh, uh, dusu ec is election yeah vijay goel was the president okay in that union 
and uh, Rajesh Sharma of that television show. He was the general secretary. They were clashing because uh, Rajat was the key figure and Vijay Goel was somebody's son. So he became the president. <laughs> anyway, so that was their own little thing. But um, I, in fact, Arun Jaitley want, was trying to sound us out ke, because he didn't want us to con want me to contest for the EC. But I contested, and you know, college loyalties are college loyalties. So I got the votes from my college, regardless of the fact that they were on, of a different uh, political hue. Anyway, I got elected. It was not not so great because it's proportional representation. No, in the e e do so easy. And of course, it was different because what is the major difference? You entered the union office. We had the first EC meeting. And you realize it's not the students who run the union, it was the Dean of Student Welfare. The Dean of Student Welfare in Delhi University, he convenes, he tells them what to do and they do it. And all these, you know, like chuhas. <laughs> <Yeah, no. laughs> I'm sorry. It's okay not to use chuhas. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so they were like, they just uh, accepted. Yeah, is it running out of time? Anyway, so then uh, that's the first thing. And then we had a first Central Council meeting. Now, in Delhi University, the Central Council comprised of at least 120 odd students from the various colleges. And uh, the EC was only 15 members. But, so the, when the Central Council walked up to Dusu office, it's a two storied building. Um, and I found on this policeman. They were lining up the staircase. The hall where the meeting is held is upstairs. So this this policeman completely lined on the staircase and at the gate and everything. And so I was wondering what is we we didn't really understand everything then. So we with the other people that I knew we who were my. my part of the council so we walked up there and then they started the meeting and in Delhi University you have to get a budget passed not like Jane, Jane doesn't have a budget and all that so in Delhi University you have to get a budget passed so the budget was placed which Kukla had uh, the Dean of Student Welfare had formulated that was placed and immediately there was total pandemonium so everybody is fighting, so the, the, you see the union was led by the ABVP, they had won that election. And the Congress had the majority in the uh, Central Council. So they just threw the chairs, broke up everything and you see, and we were just, you know, a few of us, we were completely marginalized just watching this show. So we just came out of the room, some of us who were there. And outside the thing, there was a group of AISF students who were saying, ABVP ki gundagardi nahi chalegi. Now, at that point of time, the gundagardi was being conducted down by the Congress. <laughs> but that was it. That's it was totally different. Then later, one of our uh, candidates actually got elected in Delhi University to the post of Joint Secretary. But it was... You just walked into the union office and there was this bo fat, sort of strong, you see, who had his feet on the table and he's sitting there and he's talking to you like this. I mean, you don't know what to do, really speaking. And you take a knife, he took a knife and put it in. This. It was a different thing, different, uh, uh, what do you call it, kind of violence. No, it was quite different. Delhi University politics was quite different from JNU. Did you frequent back to JNU? Going back to JNU during your duty? Not really so much. This is why I said, you know, because I learned in Delhi University a lot of other things. And somehow that me it meant also that I, I would become distant from a protected space. JNU was a protected space. So I moved 
more into Delhi. Of course, I used to go during the elections. I used to go during elections and at the time of counting and things like that, etc. But I didn't hang around in January. I don't go to the alumni. That's just my own personal thing. Yeah. How different is mobilization in JNU and in DU regarding any social issues that were raised during protest? You know, I, I, I mean, uh, JNU was, uh, when I was there, uh, they were, uh, it's not as if only we were there, no? there were other tendencies also, other groups. You know. So, for example, there was a group of feminists also, uh, of whom the most prominent was Rehana Bhatt, I don't know whether you know about her, her, but anyway. She and uh, there were some others who later came with SFI, but who were there. So they uh, led something about a girl's entry into the boys' hostel. So there was something like that. So that also probably opened the doors to uh, girls' entry into boys' hostels in general. But it had bec it became, I think, a practice, a more easy practice because. Of when the hostels in the upper campus came up, then um, they were not so stringently, uh, what do you call it, organized. You know, who was going to stop who from going? People you started just walking around into any hostel. Election campaign time they used to go, so it became a little freer than it was when the, you know, the down campus and up campus, no? So, in my time, most of the uh, activities were still centered in the down campus. That was the thing. But uh, so th you could say that's a social issue. That was a non-issue in Delhi University. Um, as far as the women's thing is concerned, um, it was in the in seventy eight or so. Uh, that the things started coming up, and uh, there's no doubt that uh, the student activism of the uh, 70s, which was not just here, but even the Chhatra Yuva uh, Morcha in Bihar and all that. So in in all of them, there was a significant presence of women, of which I am one of. I'm just one of. But we were all there. Maybe they were not thinking as women. We didn't think of ourselves as a separate category or things like that, but we were all there. So there was a big mobilization of, uh, of women, in which there was a section which start, was definitely thinking a lot more about women's issues. And you must remember, I came from a family which I didn't face these problems. Many of them did face a lot of problems. So it was only natural that they would it would come from them and not from a person like me, you know. So it came uh, up, and so there was there was saying in, in JNU there was an exhibition which was uh, uh, just after the emergency, and in the meantime the committee on status of women in India that report had come and it had become very big. Everybody had started talking about it. Many of the women leaders in jail during the emergency read it in jail when they were in jail. So there was a there was a general. Uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, something in the air. It was in the air that it would come, and people started talking about it also. So we also became part of it. I can't say, for example, that I am one of the ones who pioneered it. Or no, I don't think so. I think it was there. It was coming, and in that we also responded. So Eve teasing became the big issue in Delhi University, which is not an issue in JNU. It was called Eve teasing in those days. I mean, <laughs> so Eve teasing was the big issue, and there were big demonstrations around Eve teasing. Then, of course, there was a, they also had this beauty contest and so on. So we, or oh, that was our thing. We said, no, what is all this? So we had a campaign on that. There was another group who felt rape was the central issue, with which 
I at that time definitely disagreed. I did not think that was the central issue for us. But we did Eve teasing, yes. So we had a, a lot of conventions, a lot of big agitations, a lot of big things. And, and at that time, because of this, there was a law passed, an anti Eve teasing law passed in Delhi. So that came from Delhi University. It was a different set of issues from what was prevailing in Jane. In JNU, because National University, it was not like Delhi University also has a central university, but it's a Delhi based primarily. In JNU, the central issue was how to democratize, how to have provide the, uh, so the admission policy was the key thing. And then of course the emergency repression and then the other things which followed. That was the thing, but it was different. Since you said that uh, you didn't face any gender related issues in your family, your family was very progressive. What exactly was your motivation to be part of women's issues? Say you also joined a women's organization. So what was your motivation? Where did, were there any instances that make you, made you feel that yeah, this is why I should join and speak for women's issues? Because you also said that uh, in SFI you acted as an individual agent, not as a female agent. So, where did this need arise to be a female agent in a political movement when you joined that women's organization? <laughs> I don't think I ever felt that I had to be a female agent, but I, I will say there are two things, you know. One is when I was, a, when I was in, I was of course in Delhi University, I was the um, prime figure in the SFR. And to be very frank, I used to wonder to myself as to whether the fact that I am a woman constrains the entry of a large number of boys. I mean, to accept, maybe they don't accept. I used to think, I used to wonder to myself whether this was a, whether I being, my being a woman was an obstacle for a uh, uh, some boys who had, you know, would deal with the aggression and everything like that, whether it was an obstacle, I used to feel that, because you don't necessarily manage only with highly civilized and cultured uh, people, you know. So I used to wonder to myself about that. But anyway, that was one thing, one aspect. But I became a whole time, you know, of this thing, and uh, uh, I wanted to work in the working people, working class, and the JMS offered that as a thing. It it was a, an organization of women, so it and it. Uh, I'd also by that time I had a, a child. I was married and I'd had a child, and so therefore I associated myself with the kinds of problems that the women were facing. But it's not, I mean, I don't know how to explain this because uh, somehow I think, you know, I don't know how we are looked at. We are not just agents or we are not just categories. We go through uh, uh, things in our lives. We don't fit in to things like this. Do you understand? Yeah, yeah, I can. My primary thing was I was with the uh, Marxist party, that was my primary. And uh, uh, for s I worked with JMS for some time, JMS was just established, it was just growing. We were all f struggling to find out how we could do it, what would be our way, uh, what would be the uh, thing. So, there were big debates at that time between the autonomous and the party led. We were supposed to be, we always felt uh, it's a mass organization which is not uh, a party front, but I was a party member, you see. So it's difficult because, you know, um, I don't know, do you understand what I'm saying? Mm. Or do you understand what I felt or what I thought? Link to that, I was wondering, the spectrum of gender issues has expanded, obviously, over time. 
specifically to include queer movements and do you suppose in JNU and TU there's an obstacle to it, there's like a limitation to it because there's a time when gender issues was linked only to the female agent. That's not so much the case anymore. Yeah, How has but it transformed over the past few decades? Well, I don't know about, uh, I mean, I still believe that there's a need for a women's movement. Okay, and it's not just a gender movement, it's a women's movement. And uh, the gender issues are there and definitely there has been a lot of rethinking on uh, various, everybody's part. Um, I have to say that when I first uh, I used to think that it was a diversionary thing in the beginning. Please excuse me, but I'm telling you seriously, because what used to happen was in the women's organization here we you you know how difficult it is to get women mobilized and women who are uh, in you see we used to wash their burdens, put on their clothes, and bring them out onto the streets in our in our city. And they had to face, some of them would get beaten up when they went back up because of certain things, etc. So there is a way in which, when I first went to the area, uh, the first thing was, you know, there, there was a, 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 an incident of an attack on, uh, on a woman by this Ramlila committee, you know, whatever it was. So we held a demonstration against the, uh, at the police station. See, this was in Mangolpuri in, and the usual randi hai, this, that and the other, everybody is subjected to this and inside the, in, in the, in the society there, there are all types of problems that exist. So with great difficulty, we used to build that sense of solidarity and growth of an organization and get something going. And then you have a missing and then uh, somebody would come and say uh, that the front, at the front, there has to be this banner of gay rights. It was a problem for us. We didn't want to be dominated. We had no objection. We had everybody used to come. I mean, in our organization, it's not as if there were gay people in the organization. There were there was no uh, other issue as far as that was concerned. But it was, I know it's not politically correct to say these things now. But this is what the way it worked. And um, it is, we also took some, we, we also got, you see, yeah, nobody was against consensual sexual relations, but we didn't consider it to be the central issue. And uh, I'm sti I don't know, uh, there are obviously so many uh, other sections which have now got organized, so they have a voice, and uh, they, it's also, but in the process, does that mean we don't need a women's movement? It's a question. Do we need only a gender-based movement? I don't agree. I think in a country like India, the women's uh, women have a role to play. And as a women's organization, on women's issues, there are big questions before us for which you need a women's movement still. So that's all that I can say. Of course, on the position of um, uh, LGBTQ, or we have all changed our, we have all moved ahead. We have seen, but I still not say that this has to be made the central issue. And it's one one of the issues amongst many. And what role do you think pamphlets play in women's movement? Since you mm. said the mobilization is quite different in that spectrum. Well, you see, it depends on where you are. Because if you're if you're uh, if you're primarily amongst an, uh, a set of people who are not uh, able to read, the pamphlet doesn't play a role. But if you are in a set where people do read, then maybe it is. I don't know. I can't really say. I'm out of that space at the moment. I can't really say that with the advent of social media, does the pamphlet has the role of the pamphlet changed? I don't know. You tell me, you're better placed. Huh? Um, I'm not sure. Yes, these days there's a lot of material on social media. And as we were talking to John Thoma about it, John Thoma was telling that there's more on social media and 
the discourse is kind of shifted over there, but the pamphlets are still like used. But yeah, I think they will still have a role to play. But you know, if 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 uh, it also depends. Suppose you have a hundred leaflets or a hundred pamphlets, it will lose its. its you know. mentioned the materiality of it changed, like in the different sixties, and now it's like you're saying it's quite different. The medium through which it's transmitted. Yeah. So I um, no, it's also this. It's uh, numbers. Uh, I mean, for example, if you have a uh, hundred leaflets being circulated in, let's say, the space of a month. You think they'll all get read? They won't. There's be a bit of an excess then. So it will depend. I think I can't. I mean, it's not. It depends on what is the nature of how intensely are people involved in what is being discussed. If they get involved through oral medium, or through the leaflet medium, or through the social medium, uh, social media medium, whichever way. It will depend on how much they are getting involved in that, whether they will, whether the medium will work. I don't think the medium itself can determine it. You know? I mean, of course, you can uh, say that. I mean, there are certain. Me I mean, any medium you can, for example, whether they are lies or whether the truth, etc. That applies to all the mediums. No. Yeah. Well, I can't think of more. Okay, okay so guys, have questions. Last, one of the last. So, how relevant was your student experience in shaping your political, your professional career? Oh, my professional career begins in two thousand and three, two thousand and one, maybe. Huh? Why is it only student? Yeah, but I grew up out. I did went into the whole thing. There's an entire movement. You know, it goes like this: I was a student, and then Mahila Samiti, then trade union, and so on and so forth. Why do you want to focus only on the students? I mean, just as a curiosity. Yeah. We're curious to know the deliberations of your early movement. Like, if Sri Lanka was the first political space that you inhabited in a very active way. Yeah, there is no doubt. I I have to acknowledge. Much I may not want to acknowledge it, but I have to acknowledge the JNU uh, shaped or the discussion in JNU shaped my basic understanding of Marxism. So that's what I'm saying, and therefore it gave gave me a perspective. And since I am in um, the area of research as a in, in terms of my work, that perspective uh, is um, uh, gives me a way of looking at things. In what ways? Like, are there any specific threads that you can trace? Or, of course, that might be a different question. But no, uh, my my research work has been primarily in the empirical domain, you know, and I have worked on women workers, women's employment, on women's migration. These are the areas. And the um, uh, work has been primarily empirical, but it is informed by my perspective and by the questions that I ask of uh, the look uh, of the of my field. You see, so that is, of course, ground that basic grounding does come from that time. But it has grown and established itself. It has. I hope matured. Uh huh. So, what does it mean how to be an activist professor? I'm not an activist professor. I mean, I'm slightly confused about this. You see, you must realize I was a whole time. I'm. I'm. I don't even think of myself as a professor. That's just a designation. You know. I'm not a career academic. No. Uh, I came to this uh, at a particular time. I came to research at a particular time, and um, I do learn a lot in my research. So it has become my field in a certain sense. It has overtaken my life to a certain extent. Uh, but I don't think of myself as a professor. 
It's also because I'm doing research, I think. I'm not in the university space now. So. Sorry, I did have one last question. Mm -hmm. That uh, in the current milieu, do you think it's possible to have academics and activism as separate entities? Has it now deviated or is there a chasm between them? Well, I don't uh, know. You see, you will always have. Who is an activist and who is an academic? I mean, uh, who do you consider to be activist? I feel that I am not sufficient of an activist now because I am doing primarily research. Somebody else may think I am an activist, but I don't consider because I have been a whole time. So I feel this loss of that. Um, let's see. But uh, but I don't know, you know. Uh, let me say I think that in the I would like to say this that you you have to understand that even today the university that is higher education um, it has let's say uh, uh, around twenty five percent of the age group eighteen to twenty five. The rest of them are outside the university space and uh, we are all members of the middle class and the middle class's sensibilities are increasingly getting distant from uh, various uh, other sections of society and uh, so we have to struggle with our own realities and in order to reflect in a activism something that is a bigger project larger this thing, we have to struggle against our own, uh, what do you call it, location to some extent. But in the case, I think you are asking in this, in the situation where the universities are under attack. And on that I don't see any, I mean everybody has to take sides today. So if somebody is not taking sides, there may be, it is inactive support to, for the um, uh, an anti-democratic assault on the education system as such. Not just on the education, it's on the people of which education is also one part. So, to that extent people are going to have to take position. But I'm not in the judgmental mode because things happen at times. There may be times when everybody is not on the same page, but I'm pretty sure that over time there's going to be quite a build up. So if the activism is in relation to the current politics, is that what you are saying, the current political dispensation in power, then there is a, there is a struggle that is there. And I think everybody is facing a part of that struggle. They are facing the problems and they are taking their positions in that struggle. Final question. This yeah. is like final. So, are most left activists ending up in academia? Do you think so? I don't think so. I would just like some precision. What do you mean by the difference between a women's movement and a feminist movement? And also, how do you see the evolution of? Uh, women or feminist movements since you've engaged yourself in those movements in the 70s and 80s uh, to, um, to today's movements which are much more organized, uh, maybe more professional movements and uh, that also uh, are influenced by NGOs and, uh, and more global institutions. It's a very big question. No, I know. That's why I'm asking you. Okay. <laughs> um, 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 like, First, what is the difference between a woman and feminist movement? Well, feminist movement, you, you have to be part of a feminist uh, uh, framework of thought. Now, um, I mean, let me say that amongst, uh, I mean, there are many who, who, who think that uh, the that feminism can incorporate every all the various types of things. It's a, as some people say, it's a capacious term and it includes everybody who's taking up something on, on behalf of women or on women's issues. 
but uh, historically that's not really the case because uh, if you i mean for example uh, uh, when it, if, if as as i understand it two or three things are there firstly i think women have been oppressed for centuries okay and yet a movement on uh, for change in that situation of women as a social movement in terms of a mass movement it comes at a particular time in history it doesn't come throughout history even though you have women saying things writing expressing their pain poetry you have you have literature you have actions on the ground you have so many things but you do not have a social movement or on, on women's issues until you come to this particular phase of our history okay that is one aspect now i would say that that is that that women's movement is inextricably linked to the rise of the working class as a social category politically movement okay because before that you do not have it you have individuals you do not have a social movement whether you take suffrage even from even if many people put universal suffrage as the first they say so even this thing it's linked to the fact that you are link, asking for a vote for all it is linked to part of universal suffrage so it has a broader thing. so that's how the women's movement also develops and it doesn't call itself necessarily feminist um but the feminist uh, movement as such emerges at a particular point in 60s which is it has a certain uh, it it uh, emerges again at a historical point of time it challenges certain norms and everything has its role eh? i mean if you take all the things they they actually change things they change the location in which uh, uh, social location for women but it's uh for the feminist movement patriarchy is the first it's the first and it uh, uh for it's not necessarily for for uh, for the rest of the women it's not they don't necessarily start off with patriarchy so there is a difference broadly speaking if you can say there's a difference in perspective between you take all the shades of feminism and you this now i don't know what you mean by uh, professionalization of movements because um, if you're talking in terms of ngos you're talking about the uh, gender agenda and uh, the emergence of women as a political constituency for the bourgeoisie huh it is very much there and uh, gender is now um, part of the um, what do you call it lexicon with which uh, ruling classes establish their legitimacy so it is very much uh, part of it. but whether that whether that means that there's a professionalization of the movement i'm not so sure it's definitely a professional careers around gender there are gen- there are there is a certain professionalization of that but is that everyone who speaks or writes or talks about women whether they are part of a big movement i'm not so sure they may be they may be just fellow travelers and um do, do you see um I mean it's just a random question I'm not going to ask do you see like a form of um a common issue between um you know people who come from marginalized groups marginalized minorities such as caste or uh, religious minorities that have raised inside the the middle class and same for women and how this this goes of acceptance of toler- tolerance of uh, you know gender equality caste equality etc is used by uh, by this general bourgeois discourse that you've described can you just insist a bit more on it like i mean in generalize it outside of the women's movement just because it interests well, i i understand your question but i'm not really wanting to talk about that just now I'm also a bit terrorized, you know. <laughs> I mean, let's be quite clear that it has become 
I mean, uh, it's there is um, in a, a there uh, there is a middle class, and there are things that happen within the middle class. And that is, I think, uh, some part of it is done in the name of other sections in society also. But it's part of this complex formation of the middle class in which there are very many issues and people face all kinds of problems. There's discrimination, definite discrimination on the basis of caste. There is both discrimination, there's discrimination on the basis of gender and there may be, you know, it's complicated. Both things are, uh, all these things are there. There's discrimination on the basis of religion. This is all within this, you see. But it's one, it can happen within the class also. And what happens is when it happens within the middle class, whether it is on the question of gender, whether it is on the question of caste, the only issue becomes, it becomes centered around discrimination. You do, you know, exploitation is, it's little out of the frame, moves out of the frame. So even when people talk, they, even when they're talking of social structures, they talk about the structures of dis discrimination. Now, I don't know what people, I have no theory of social movements or, any, or anything like that, let me tell you. But I do, I have my, in my life, I have seen that it is the material force of a big social movement and a big participation that changes the whole thing. It doesn't necessarily have to be through a just direct confrontation. I am setting out to fight patriarchy. Will that r get rid of patriarchy? It may not, but I am setting out to fight to change this whole thing. In the process, all these women are coming out and they are doing several things it may have an impact also on patriarchy. That may also have, if I say that I am fighting patriarchy, but if there is a big mobilization of women for a bigger, so, a big social thing, you can also actually transform things. That is what, I think that is a process. So there are tangential social movements which also contribute to women's liberation. No, it's not a psychological, I speak out and therefore it changes and I don't know, it doesn't happen. It's, you have to have a material force. That material force is, your question regarding how the ruling classes use all these, see, that's a concrete question which has to be addressed in a given situation. I don't think we can make a general statement right now for all sections and all kinds of trends.